Lord, we do come to you and we, we stop again and we do give thanks to you for, for the many blessings you've given to us. Lord, I know in just a, about a week and a half we set aside a day to give thanks. Lord, we in this season of the year are mindful particularly of the abundance of blessings. Lord, as we do have so much good, so many just physical goods in our life, the warm clothes, the warm house, or the fridges and cabinets full of food, closets that are full of clothes. Lord, many of us have, have really more than we can really know what to do with. We, we thank you for that abundance that you've given to us. Yeah, Lord, in that abundance, we pray that we will not be distracted by it, that we will not, our, our fruitfulness will not be choked out by the many things that we have. But Lord, that we will see all of these, these gracious gifts as, as things entrusted to our care, that we may steward them well, that we may use them for the increase of your kingdom, for the edification of believers, Lord, for the evangelization of the law. That by our lives and by our use of the things you've given us, we may exalt you. Lord, we are mindful this morning of the, the Fisher family as they, they grieve together. Lord, it sounds like an unexpected death. And so I pray that you will give them particular grace as they, uh, Lord, I'm sure still numb from the shock and the surprise. And so I, I pray that your word will minister deeply to that family. Lord, your presence will be very real that they may know that your grace is truly sufficient for them in this time of loss. Lord, that they will see and know your goodness, that it never fails, it never falters. Lord, you are working all things for the good of those who love you. You're using this in their life that they may be more like Christ. And so I I ask that you will minister that, that grace that only comes from you. Lord, for their friends and family that, that seek to comfort them, that you will give great wisdom to those. Lord, that those in the church who may know the family, that you will give them particular grace to speak the words of comfort, words of hope and truth to them in this time. Lord, we, we do bow together, asking again for this church. Father, our hearts are particularly burdened by the the many unsaved around us. Lord, we know that there's so many in Manistink that do not know you. Lord, so many on our hearts and names and individuals that we specifically have been praying for. And Lord, we earnestly plead again for their salvation. That Lord, you will, you will open their eyes that they may see the glory of the gospel. Lord, that you will convict their hearts that they may know their need of a Savior. Lord, that you will draw them to yourself, that they may come to you for forgiveness and eternal life. And so, God, I pray that you will do a mighty work in saving the lost. And, Lord, do that work in us, that we may be bold and we may be faithful witnesses, carefully and compassionately, forcefully and honestly giving the gospel. That we may have abundant opportunities to proclaim you Again, Lord, that souls may be saved for your eternal glory. Lord, we lift up these requests and ourselves before you, asking that you will work in this church, work in this gathering here to make us more like your son. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. As Naomi plods along the road leading into the city, All of Bethlehem is talking about her return. The women of the city come out to meet her and greet her with great astonishment and I presume with great joy. They were astonished to see again one who had left them ten years earlier. During those ten years, Naomi suffered intensely. Her husband died and then her two sons died. She was left bereft in deep poverty in a foreign land, and with no means of earning a living for herself. Though only 10 years had passed, I think that Naomi had aged 20. And all of Bethlehem was abuzz with the news of her return. And so the women cry out, is this Naomi? 
But Naomi does not share their enthusiasm. She responded harshly to those who greeted her and began to complain to them about her circumstances. She responds to the wonder and amazement of the city with complaints against God. So at the end of Ruth 1, Naomi's bitterness becomes very apparent. Just a few verses before the ones we're about to read, she had said to Ruth and Orpah, I am much more bitter than you because the hand of the Lord is against me. And now in verses 20 and 21, she tells all of the women of Bethlehem all of the faults of God, at least as she sees it. Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. It says, Now the two of them, that is Ruth and Naomi, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? In verses 20 and 21, Naomi says four things against God. First, she says, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She says, God has vexed me. God has dealt harshly with her and traumatized her. The second thing she says is, the Lord has brought me home empty. She says that she left full, but God stripped everything away from her. He took it all, and everything that she loved, he took from her so that she returned home with nothing. Again, because God had taken it away from her. And the third thing she says is, the Lord has testified against me. So God not only afflicted her and emptied her, but she saw her her circumstances as God's voicing his opposition to her. That God is against her. She imagined him to be like a, a witness in court who testifies against a criminal. So Naomi said God had testified against her. And then the last thing she says is the Almighty has afflicted me. She returns basically to the first statement, the first idea. She declares again that God has done her great harm. She says that God hurt her and worked evil against her. Naomi's words are an honest expression of her heart. She tells it how she sees it, how she feels it to be. And the reality is, Naomi's words may resonate with you this morning. You may feel today like she does, that God has done you great harm and has taken from you all that you loved. Naomi's words may echo words that you have said in the past. You may remember times in your life where you felt much like she did. Naomi's words are an accurate expression of her own emotions, and maybe they're an accurate expression of your emotions, but they are an inaccurate description of how God deals with his children. So Naomi may truly feel this way, but she feels this way because she has wrongly evaluated her circumstances. She is truly being transparent with her feelings, but her feelings are wrong. You may truly feel a certain way about something, but that does not mean those feelings are true. Our feelings, the way we, our emotions and the things that we sometimes think are uncontrollable are in fact shaped and directed by both our heart and our mind. Our feelings are shaped by our desires and our understanding, by what we want and what we know. And if you do not see the situation correctly, if you do not understand it correctly, if you do not desire the things of God properly, then you will not feel properly or correctly about your situation. And Naomi's feelings are wrong simply because she's bitter. And her bitterness is distorting her view of God. 
she cannot understand her circumstances correctly because she doesn't view God rightly. And until she corrects her view of God, she will not respond rightly to what's going on. And all of us have situations in our life that tempt us toward bitterness. We lose relationships, dreams, loved ones, jobs, income, possessions, home, health. And in those times of loss, we struggle to understand God's purposes. Maybe we don't even consider that we ought to give thanks to God for everything. Because we cannot see any possible reason to be thankful in those times of intense tribulation. And as a direct result, we incline towards bitterness against God. Now this bitterness against God is, is significantly different from bitterness towards people. It may be expressed in similar ways, but there's a crucial difference. When we are bitter at people... It is often because somebody has wronged us. And, and many, many times, it's not an imagined wrong. It's a real wrong that they have done. And so instead of forgiving the person, you hold a grudge against them. And that resentfulness and anger and unforgiving attitude toward that person is bitterness against them. But when we are bitter against God, we can never truly say God has sinned against us. We can never truly say God has wronged us. Now God may have done something in your life that you did not like. God may have done something in your life that you would never plan and that you don't even understand it right now. But God never errs. Again, he certainly never sins in his dealing with people. And so bitterness against God is not holding something against God for what he's done wrong. Bitterness against God is, is, is holding something against God for what he's done, even though it was right. And bitterness against God is not resolved for by forgiving God. He has done nothing wrong. And if you hear somebody tell you you just need to forgive God, leave immediately because they're lying to you about your God. He has done nothing wrong. Rather, bitterness against God is resolved by gaining a right understanding of God's character and purposes. Now notice, I did not say bitterness against God is resolved by gaining a right understanding of how your circumstances are going to work out for good. Oftentimes, we don't know that. We're not able to gain that understanding. Rather, the solution to bitterness against God is a right understanding of God. When we see Him correctly, we will be able to respond rightly to the painful situations in our life. So that ultimately, bitterness against God is a discontentment with the way God is running the world or your own life. We become bitter about, against God because we imagine we could do a better job of directing our own lives. Now, you may not have ever thought those exact words, but when you blame God for his administration of your life, you are acting as if you know better than he does. You are acting as if you should be in charge and he should not. And so the solution to Naomi's bitterness, the solution to your own is to regain that right view of God. So that when we correctly understand what God is like, and we believe that He always and only plans our good, then we will come to the point of no longer being bitter against God. And it is here in this portion of Ruth that Naomi serves us as a bad example. She teaches us what bitterness looks like, and she helps us identify the necessary and specific correctives to our error in understanding and faith. And the first thing we see is that Naomi did not see the world properly. She didn't even see her own circumstances rightly. Verse 21 again, she says, I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Naomi imagined that she had left Bethlehem full. 
Now, we know better. We've already read the first, the first verses of this, this book. We know that she had left Bethlehem because there was a famine in the land. They would not have gone away if they were not experiencing great hardship. Naomi had a family, but no food. She was not full. She was famished. And even worse, which seemed to be completely overlooked by her, is that she left the country, the place where she could worship God, to go to a pagan land. So for 10 years, Naomi was separated from the tabernacle, the feast, the sacrifice, and the true worship of God. She left Israel hungry, and she actually spent 10 years in spiritual destitution. And she has now finally returned to the place where she can once again come before God. Now, when she returned to Bethlehem, we know she did not come back with her family. She suffered intense loss during that time of Moab. And, and I do not discount, I do not in any way want to diminish the severity of her suffering. She came back to Bethlehem with less than she had when she left. She was truly destitute. However, when she left, she was not in an idyllic situation in great prosperity. She left in the midst of suffering. She did not go out full. She went out empty. If you will, came back emptier. But that's a big difference from going out full and coming back empty. When we are bitter at God... We do not see the world, ourselves, or our circumstances properly. Often when we are bitter, we see the past wrongly. We imagine, we, we recreate the memories and, and imagine that our previous circumstances were better than they really were. We begin to exaggerate the extent of our loss. We embellish our suffering and we tell ourselves our, our life is worse now than it truly is. And again, I do not mean that in any way we minimize the reality of our sufferings. We do not look at that and say, well, it's no big deal. Rather, we learn, must learn to see our circumstances honestly, to understand our losses as they truly are and to recognize that the good old days were not quite as good as we tend to think. And sometimes we see the past wrongly by imagining the present would be much better if that person was still in your life or if you had never suffered that loss or if you were, now, were not now experiencing that pain. We imagine that if I didn't go through that, now would be so much better. Now, I can say two things to that with absolute certainty this morning. First, you do not know your life would be better without that pain. You cannot know. None of us can know what might have been. But most importantly, this life that you are experiencing right now is the life God has planned for you for your best. So if you're the child of God, I can truly say this is your best life now. Now it's not the life you may have dreamed of. It's not the life you would have, you would have chosen for yourself. It may not even be an enjoyable life right now. But I, what you have right now is far better than anything you could devise for yourself. If you are the child of God, you have a life planned out by God with every single step ordered by Him for your eternal increase. So that you would not be ultimately better off if you did not suffer whatever you have suffered. Let me enter very quickly. I do not in any way say that to justify any wrong that has happened. The fact that God orchestrates evil for good 
does not in any way excuse or justify those who commit evil. They are still fully responsible for their wickedness. And so this does not at all justify evil men who do wicked things. Rather, it shows us that God rules over even the intentions of the wicked to produce eternal good for his children so that where you are right now is exactly where God wants you for your best. And that, that may be hard to accept, but it absolutely is the truth that God's Word declares to us. So like Naomi, when we are bitter, we see our past wrong and we see our God wrong. Much of this, these two verses, verses 20 and 21, are, are just simply a complaint against God. She maligns the character of God. She imagined God was against her. Particularly that, that phrase there says, the Lord has testified against me. She views him as an enemy who is a, opposed to her. Now, Naomi rightly recognizes that God held sovereign control over every event in her life. And so I would fully affirm with Naomi that God planned all of the event, events that happened to her even the tragic death of her husband and sons. So the question here is not if God ordained these events. The problem is not that Naomi saw God as in control of these events. Rather, Naomi's problem is she weaponized God's sovereignty. She saw that God's sovereign control and she said, He's against me. He's attacking me. She believed the afflictions that she was suffering were God's expression of animosity against her. She saw her circumstances as a silent witness that God was mad at her and wanted to bring her harm. And again, I can state categorically, certainly, that is not and was not the case. That was not true of Naomi. We're going to see that in the weeks ahead. But even if we did not have Ruth chapters 2 through 4, even if all we knew about Naomi was Ruth chapter 1, we know God was not against Naomi because of what we read in the books of Moses, particularly Exodus and Deuteronomy. We know Naomi was a descendant of Abraham. She was the daughter of those who had stood at Mount Sinai and entered into the Mosaic Covenant with God. She was the daughter of those who had stood on the east side of the Jordan River and reconfirmed that Mosaic Covenant with God. She was the daughter of those who had gone into the land of Canaan and had seen God give them victory after victory in the land. Naomi was a member of the people of God. She was a part of this covenant community with God and she enjoyed all of the blessings and cursings of that covenant of God with Israel. So that Naomi was a party in the covenant with God. As a result of that, she has an absolute assurance, as she should have had, an absolute assurance of blessing from God if she was obedient to him. But as a member of the covenant people of God, Naomi also had the assurance that when God did bring suffering on any of them, it was to bring them back to repentance. For example, in Deuteronomy 29, God speaks of the curses that he would bring on Israel when they disobeyed him. However, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God promised that when the Israelites were afflicted, remembered the covenant of God, and returned to him, then he would have compassion on them, receive them back into the land, and make them more prosperous than they were before. Deuteronomy 29 and 30 show us God's judgment has a purpose. God judges his people to bring them back to himself. God's judgment, or if you will, his chastening is not for their harm, but for their eventual good. So that even if Naomi was truly under the chastening hand of God, which is possible in this situation, and, and I think Naomi suggests that when she says that God had afflicted her, 
even if she was being chastened by God, she was not being chastened for her harm. God had orchestrated those tragic events in her life for her good. And and we know the rest of the story, or if you do know the rest of the story, you know that because of what happened, Naomi was soon to receive blessing far greater than her suffering. She was ultimately, because of what happened, she was ultimately to receive eternal blessing. Now, I'm not going to say more about that this morning, but if you read the rest of Ruth on your own, I think you'll see for yourself how God used Naomi's intense sorrow to bring her eternal blessing and infinite joy. When we are bitter against God, just like Naomi, we misunderstand his character and his good purposes in bringing sorrowful circumstances to us. Proverbs 3 declares, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Hebrews chapter 12 quotes that passage in Proverbs and then tells us God chastens us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. And then Hebrews 12 11 says now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Nobody ever enjoyed getting a spanking. It never seems joyful for the present but painful. Nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. To those who have been trained by it. So Naomi imagined that God's hand was against her. And that was not the case. Even if God was chastening her for sin. He was doing so for her benefit. That she might be brought back to him. And that she might increase in holiness and righteousness. And if you're the child of God, nothing in your life is planned by God for your hurt. Every event, all the pain, hurt, and loss is planned by Him for your eternal benefit. So that if you are the child of God, you can be absolutely certain that every trial in your life is for your good. God has brought those things to you so that you will be more holy, so that you will bear the fruit of righteousness. God has brought temporary suffering that you might gain eternal good. Naomi misunderstood her past. She misunderstood her God. And the last error Naomi made in her bitterness is she let her circumstances define her. She tells them, do not call me Naomi. That's the name she was given, we presume, at birth. It's a name that meant something like pleasant or delight. It's a happy name, whatever it actually means. It's a happy name. She rejected that name to take a new name for herself. The Hebrew word for bitter or bitterness is marar. And Naomi changed her name to Mara. She's identifying herself by her bitter circumstances and her bitter heart. And in doing so, she ignored key truths about herself. She was not a victim of circumstance. Her life had not been redefined by her laws. She was still an Israelite. She was still a member of the covenant people of God. She still had the ability to enter into the worship of the Lord. She had received the law of God. It's very likely that she had heard herself, the prophets of God, proclaiming the word of God. And she forgot the incredible benefits that were hers as a daughter of Abraham. She forgot who she was in God and she let her situation define her instead of letting her God define her. And when we are bitter, we define our lives by our hurts. We identify ourselves in relation to the wrongs done against us or the perceived wrongs, as the case may be. 
Now, I'm not going to give you in any way some motivational poster type exhortation and tell you that you're stronger than your circumstances, that you define who you are, or that you will come out of this stronger than you went in. Some of that is just pure poppycock. The rest of it, I can't say if it's true or not. What I do know, what I do know for certain is if you're the child of God, you're not defined by your situation. You are not defined by your circumstances, whether good or bad. You're not defined by your employment or lack of it, by your marital status or lack thereof, by your in in income or lack thereof, or your education or anything else. You are not defined by your loss or disease or sorrow. You are not defined by your pain, but by your loving Father who planned the pain to increase your eternal joy. So that if you are the child of God, you are defined by your relationship with us, with you. And when we permit these troubles to define us, we forget that we are Christians who still have a home in heaven, who still have eternal life who still have the Word of God before us, who still have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, who still have the unfailing presence of God, who still have the unshakable promises of God, and who still have an undestroyable relationship with Him. When we define ourselves by our circumstances, we forget that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we're bitter, we forget who we are in Christ and focus on what our bitter hearts say we are. And so bitterness lies to you by exaggerating the severity of your present hurts, by distorting the character of God, and by making your circumstances your identity. And you must not believe any of those lies. You must learn to think rightly about life, God, and self. And I fully recognize, I'm not sitting here talking to a bunch of people who've just, you know, maybe you've stubbed your toe once or twice, and, but otherwise our lives have been pretty happy-go-lucky. I recognize full well that there's some here have gone through painful divorces. Some have suffered cancers and other severe diseases. Some have debilitating diseases which have radically altered their lives and from which they will never recover. Some have been viciously abused, whether it be emotionally or physically or sexually. Some have been grievously slandered. Some have lost things that they think they will never recover from. Our church is full of tales of tragedy. And, and I recognize full well the difficulty of, of doing what I'm prescribing in this sermon. And yet at the same time, that is the only way that we can respond. It's the only right way. It's the only beneficial way. So we do not, and none of this is intended to downplay any of our history. It's not, we cannot say it's no big deal. The right response to pain is not to deny it. The Christian response to suffering is not to keep a stiff upper lip. It's not to grin and bear it. It's not to act as if everything is fine and we just put on a smile and hope nobody notices. That's not the biblical teaching at all. The biblical teaching is to see yourself, your God, and your life properly. The biblical teaching is that you must see your circumstances, past and present, through the lens of Scripture, and through the perfect goodness of God. That when you are overwhelmed by difficulties, remember the truth of your life as defined by God. Remember who your God is. At the same time, I know when you're overwhelmed by difficulties, remembering those things is incredibly difficult to do. 
So that if you're struggling this morning to believe that God intends your present pain for eternal good, and consider the lives of Joseph, Job, and Jesus. Joseph, he later saw the great good that God was accomplishing through his suffering. He came to recognize the good many years after his period of intense suffering. Job, he never was told what God was accomplishing. We don't know if he ever understood it or not. But despite that, we do know that God was working great benefit in Job's life. And as a result, he worked through Job great benefit in our own lives. Thousands of years of the people of God have been benefited and blessed by the suffering of Job. Job learned to see his God correctly through his trials. And we learn the same thing because of Job's sorrow. We go to Jesus and we know that he knew full well the suffering he would endure we knew he knew full well the benefit it would produce. He willingly submitted himself to the Father because of the great joy that he would receive as a result of his suffering. And we will never know the gain from our suffering as fully as Jesus did. We'll never know the extent of our suffering as fully as Jesus did. But we also know that we, never, we will never suffer as innocently as Jesus did. We can imitate our Savior by suffering graciously and trustingly because we are convinced our God will always do what is best. We can commit ourselves to the care of the one who always does right, who always judges righteously, and who always works all things out for the good of those who love him. You can look at those three lives and be assured that if you're the child of God, then God is in complete control. God loves you. And God is using your sorrow for a much greater blessing and gain. I would say, real simple, do not be like Naomi. In your intense agony, do not push God away but rather hold close to him, no matter how much you hurt. Let's pray. Lord, I do ask that, Lord, these challenging words may encourage and help us. Lord, I pray if there is any here that is struggling with bitterness towards you, that in their hurt, they imagine that you are against them. They will be able to say, as David did, this I know, for God is for me. Lord, in the midst of their suffering, they will run to you and cling to you and your goodness, trusting your good purposes. And Lord, that each of us, whether we are in the midst of tribulation now or whether we face it in days ahead, that we will remember your unfailing, unchanging, perfect character, that we will remember that all of these things are for eternal gain. That is far more wonderful than anything we may lose here. So Lord, I pray that you'll continue your work in us. For your namesake we pray. Amen.